daytime, and they reported on about 42 uh, patients. In all of their patients, except uh, a small number, the CO2 values were completely corrected, and the uh, survival uh, was uh, very impressive with a, a median survival of uh, 31, uh, age 31 years in uh, 42 patients with CO2 correction from 62 to uh, 43. And they had no adverse consequences in uh, 184 patient years. So that would be you know, 10 patients times 18 years or 18 patients times uh, 10 years. Now, um, compared to airway clearance, really providing non-invasive ventilation is actually the easy part. I think the airway clearance is actually the hardest, and that's why I like to, to start uh, talking about that. Um, so bi-level ventilation is uh, the non-invasive ventilation used uh, overnight. Uh, it's used through a, a nasal or an oronasal uh, mask. And of course, because it's held in place with a mask, one can sleep. Um, Whereas during the daytime, using a mask is not nearly as uh, viable because it's difficult to communicate, it's difficult to, uh, to eat. So really, mask ventilation is best for uh, nighttime support. So at this stage four, then, um, uh, respiratory uh, support may have to be provided 24 hours a day uh, and... Uh, again, a tracheostomy may be advised in many jurisdictions, but I would strongly suggest that mouthpiece be uh, considered first. Uh, this is done using a chair-mounted uh, volume ventilator. Uh, traditionally, uh, they were the large 35-pound uh, LP10s. Uh, currently, there's a significant number of uh, laptop ventilators uh, available, and some folks here um, have those uh, today. And generally, mouthpiece ventilation begins with some assistance during the day, maybe a few hours at a time, but will generally progress to uh, requiring ventilation virtually for uh, every breath. It's non-invasive um, so that it can be easily used or not used. Its complexity is much, much less than a tracheostomy. Because the ventilator has the capacity to increase pressure substantially, you're able to breath stack anytime you want to. Just as we sigh and yawn 10 or 12 times an hour, someone with muscular dystrophy can use the mouthpiece to stack breaths on top of each other without anybody else's help to recruit lung volume and maintain lung and, and chest wall compliance. Often folks that we've treated who have been on inadequate nighttime ventilation and, and then added mouthpiece ventilation feel much better, sleep better, and interestingly, their, their swallowing function often improves. And that's actually was well documented in the uh, paper that I described from, uh, from Belgium. So this is a, a larger uh, volume ventilator on the back of a powered chair to a, uh, a, a mouthpiece. You might recognize uh, David uh, here. So he's using a, a Tigon tubing for uh, mouthpiece ventilation and a chair-mounted uh, volume ventilator. At least it's set in the volume settings. You can see the cough assist here in the background. This is our humble, uh, humble laboratory. And uh, you know, this can lead to improved mobility in spite of the need for ventilation and one can participate in one's uh, chosen pastime. Might not be the team you would cheer for. But. <laughs> so here's a, a nice uh, clinical example of uh, a young man that uh, Dr. Bigger referred to me um, who uh, lives in Newmarket. And when he uh, was seen by his respirologist, he was instructed that he should have a tracheostomy. And you know, to be fair, um, I mean, I just spoke to the U of T respiratory fellows yesterday, and this is not what they're used to hearing about. So to be fair, if you have a young man about whom you're concerned with a CO2 of 65 or whatever it was in your office saying, I don't want to have a tracheostomy, um, 
well, that's his choice. Um, but you may be uncomfortable with that if you are unfamiliar with the alternatives. So you write a letter um, that makes it clear as to what you felt the patient's plans should have been to have a tracheostomy, to go to the ICU, to go to rehabilitation, um, to learn how to be uh, managed with tracheostomy ventilation at home because that's what you were taught and that's what's safe and secure. Um, so to be, f to be fair, that's how we're trained. Um, I would like to suggest that a little bit more open-mindedness um, and a gradual acquisition of experience with mouthpiece ventilation would probably be the better uh, choice. So this was the therapeutic um, recommendation that was made and the cost of this, and not the cost that is that important, it, but this is what falls out as a consequence of uh, tracheostomy versus non-invasive ventilation. Um, the cost over a year would have been about $230,000, whereas we saw this young man on three outpatient vis visits, taught him lung volume recruitment, uh, use of daytime mouthpiece ventilation. Uh, he had a cough assist device which we reviewed in terms of the pressures and how to use it to properly. We saw him on three occasions uh, as an outpatient. And the cost of that would be about $32,000 over a year, which would include the kind of uh, home care that he might need at home with non-invasive ventilation. So in that one individual in one year, the quality of life is better and the cost is less by about $200,000. And it's now been four years since he was told he needed a tracheostomy. And here are the results of his uh, visit um, this is the spontaneous vital capacity here at first visit, about 600 cc's. And what I want you to appreciate is that over a year, from June 05 to August 06, his spontaneous vital capacity, in other words, his own capabilities, actually increased over that year. And his maximum insufflation capacity increased substantially. So that he now has an MIC of over two liters, which is perfectly adequate to maintain airway clearance because that yields a much higher cough. And I would argue that we're making some, we're, we're reversing some of the restriction of the lungs and thorax and now making them more compliant, able to accommodate more uh, volume. And they're able to be distended at a lower pressure, which means the non-invasive ventilation is more effective at lower pressures, less mask leak. These things all complement each other in the long-term uh, utility of, of ventilation and the prevention of, of, of uh, infection. Carbon dioxide level diminished to perfectly normal levels and the oxygen level improved uh, in kind. So I think he's actually finished uh, uh, college now. And here he is using his uh, mouthpiece. His father, I think, is an engineer, and he made this amazing um, attachment for the, uh, for the mouthpiece. But he's done uh, really very well. Now here's a young man with uh, Duchenne who unfortunately had a, an, a really unfortunate misadventure where a change of a peg tube resulted in a, gastro, a small gastric perforation and he ended up with um, abdominal sepsis and was admitted to the, uh, went to the OR, had the, the stomach oversown uh, and went to the ICU intubated. So you can see that looking at the download, he's on nighttime bi-level ventilation until this point where he's in the ICU for about five days. Then he's, and I give them credit for this, most places this young man would end up with a tracheostomy in the ICU. If anybody's been in this position, that it's simply the done thing. Um, with our involvement, uh, they had the, uh, you know, we agreed that he would be extubated back to non-invasive ventilation, which you can see he's now using for almost 24 hours a day, which is pretty much untenable, you know, to be on a mask 24 hours a day. So we reintroduced, well, he hadn't been on it yet, we introduced mouthpiece ventilation in the ICU. Uh, and the introduction of mouthpiece ventilation meant that he was now using the bi-level for the same hours uh, overnight and was able then to use his uh, mouthpiece during the daytime. 
and you can see